Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 23 through 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you in the word. Lord, as we study today, take these words that I've prepared, transform them via your Holy Spirit into the words that we need to hear. Lord, that we might be filled and that you might be glorified in heaven. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we are building the foundations of our faith. We're, we're on this series, We Believe. This is week five, and each week we have presented a foundational, non-negotiable of our faith. These are the things that if you take one away, our faith begins to crumble, and we have no faith at all. Today, last week we talked about, we had a reminder of the Wesleyan uh, graces. We talked about that provenient grace of God that is that wooing us into a relationship. God wants us to be in a relationship with him. And as we think about that, sometimes it could be as simple as a grandparent praying for you that you would come to know Christ. Uh, 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 maybe a coworker sharing a scripture with you while you're not in relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's the times that we have found Jesus and we fall away, God's provenient grace is still pursuing us, trying to drag us back into a relationship with God. It's sad that we have to be dragged back into a relationship with God at times, isn't it? But that's the reality. It may be you're driving down the road and a song comes on that speaks to you the goodness of God. That's provenient grace pursuing us, trying to bring us back into relationship. And then we talk about that moment that we accept that provenient grace and we realize that Jesus is real and we say yes to Christ. In that exact moment, we are justified before the Lord. Your slate has been wiped clean. It doesn't matter what you've done, who you are, where you've been. It doesn't matter the road you took. It is clean, wiped clean. Justification because of faith in Christ. And now today we're going to talk about sanctifying the sanctification, perfect sanctification, or being sanctified in Christ. We look at this core belief, and we go to a great theological source to get us started this morning. We're going to look at the definition of sanctification in Wikipedia. You laugh, but hear what they have to say. Sanctification, or in its verb form, sanctify, literally means to set apart for special purpose or use. That is to make holy or sacred. Therefore, sanctification refers to the state or process of being set apart, made holy, as a vessel full of the Holy Spirit of God. It continues, the concept of sanctification is widespread among religions, including Judaism and especially Christianity. The term can be used to refer to objects which are set apart for special purposes. For the most common use within Christian theology is in reference to the change brought about by God in a believer, begun at the point of salvation and continuing throughout the life of the believer. Many forms of Christianity believe that this process will only be completed in heaven, but some believe that complete holiness is possible in this life. Now, let me say this. Wikipedia is 100% correct. There is no fallacy in that statement whatsoever. The reason it's right is because sanctification, the theology of it, has never, ever, ever, ever been in dispute in the Christian faith. And so if the world says it's right and the church says it's right and this is what we believe, then we can probably take that to the bank that that's the definition of sanctification. In fact, it's so accepted that in our official articles of religion, it's uh, not printed there. Rather, we have it as an addendum to that. And so if you brought your book with you today, your We Believe book, we're on page 14. If you didn't, it's okay. I'm going to read it for you. This is what we say about sanctification or perfection. We hold that the wonder of God's acceptance and pardon does not end God's saving work. 
which continues to nurture our growth in grace. In other words, we believe that once we've been saved, God's grace still works in our life, and it still moves us on to a better state. It says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to increase in the knowledge and the love of God and in love for our neighbor. New birth is the first step in the process of sanctification. Sanctifying grace draws us toward the gift of Christian perfection, which Wesley described as a heart habitually filled with love for God and neighbor and as having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. This gracious gift of God's power and love, the hope and the expectation of the faithful is never warranted by our efforts nor limited by our frailties. And so it's God's grace moving us closer and closer to God, opening us up to the love of God in a deeper way. So let's walk through that a little bit slower. Renewal of our fallen nature by the Spirit received through faith in Jesus. The renewal does not happen without the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you hear me? The renewal doesn't happen without the power of the Holy Spirit, nor without faith in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, enters in us, and we use the Holy Spirit to sanctify us in this life. Jesus' blood on the cross cleansed us from our sin. Let me say that again. Jesus' blood on the cross cleansed us from our sin. There are pastors today standing in pulpits who refuse to speak about the blood of Jesus. They fail to preach about the blood of Jesus because they say it's too gory. <laughs> if you want to know where your pastor stands, ask them about the blood of Jesus. Y'all can come talk to me about that anytime. But if they cringe, if they say, oh, I don't want to talk about that, then you find you a new pastor. It's kind of like uh, Jeff Foxworthy, the redneck comedian. You know, he does the thing, you might be a redneck if. We could actually do kind of a church-wide one. You might be a pagan if. <laughs> you might be a pagan if you don't believe in the virgin birth. You might be a pagan if you don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. You might be a pagan if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You might be a pagan. Now, if y'all hear that down the road, uh, some Christian comedian uses that. You heard it here first, so I get dibs on that. <laughs> the very end of our belief statement says, Whose blood of atonement cleanseth from all sin, whereby we are not only delivered from the guilt of sin, but are washed from its pollution, saved from its power, and are enabled through grace to love God with all our hearts and to walk in His holy commandments blameless. Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross removes our sins, cast them as far as the east is from the west, removes the guilt of that sin, and we're saved then from the power of sin. That's a good thing. Sanctification from the Holy Spirit also saves us from the power of sin in our lives, meaning that the Holy Spirit is when we give authority to the Holy Spirit, will push the sin out of our life. The more we invite the Holy Spirit in, the less room there is for sin. That will allow us to walk in God's holy commandments blameless. We don't walk in our sin and expect Christ to cover the debt. That's what our society says today. You've probably heard, the, heard it. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, I just do what I want because Jesus died for me and it's all covered. That's the world's idea of what Christ did. That's pretty selfish, isn't it? To say, I'm just going to do what I want because Christ already died for that, so it's no big deal. Hmm. That is the modern day Gnostic movement at work. There is no sin because Jesus covered it all. Now live how you want. Now, I'm aware that over the past five weeks, maybe some of this theology has rubbed you a little bit. <laughs> and I'm not talking like a good massage. I'm talking like rubbed you. And that's okay. When we teach theology, it's important we get it right. And sometimes in our own thinking, we get it wrong. And when you feel rubbed, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you need to look at this closer. You need to 
hone in on that. And I would say if, if, if you're not in and you don't believe these non-negotiables of a faith, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a Unitarian church in Tulsa that's taken people because we're about the faith here, the Christian faith, the believer's faith. All right, so every week, like I do, I want to bring in uh, the great hymnist Charles Wesley. Uh, <clears throat> he wrote a hymn that talks about our sanctifying grace, and that is on page 384 if you want to look. If not, I'm going to read it to you. You know I like reading hymns. It's called Love Divine, All Love Excelling, 384 in the hymnal. So listen to these words. In fact, at the very top, there's a, there's a title called Sanctifying and Perfecting Grace. This is, this is beautiful. Love divine, all love excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. All thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion. Pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Talking about the salvation of Jesus, yes. Breathe, O oh breathe, thy loving spirit into every true bled breast, troubled bled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find the second rest. Take away our bent to sinning. Alpha and Omega be. End of faith as its beginning. Set our hearts at liberty. Put our sin aside, Lord. Get rid of it. Set our hearts free. Verse 3. Come, Almighty, to deliver. Let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Thee we would be always blessing. Serve thee as thy host above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. Finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. What a beautiful picture of Christ sanctifying us through his sacrifice on the cross. And us letting go of that sin and living in unity with God. Beautiful, beautiful hymn. I think that was written in 1747, somewhere around there. Wow. So how about some practical application? We believe sanctifying grace is the gift of God providing the desire and the power to grow in our relationship with God forever. Hear that again. It is the gift of God providing the desire and the power to grow in our relationship with God forever. You want to desire God, it is sanctifying grace that pushes us, that, that moves us to have a desire for God and to grow in that relationship. I liken it to being born. Our physical life begins, there's this continual process of growth and maturing in that. We go from squirming on the ground to crawling, Yes. Crawling to walking. Yes. Walking to running. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a little one in the house, but that moment from walking to running is extremely scary, isn't it? <laughs> You're constantly chasing after. We have a new puppy, by the way. <clears throat> that dude runs everywhere at everything. And so it's this constant run to, to keep up with it. That's what happens in our body. We grow from squirming to crawling, crawling to walking, walking to running. As well as our minds, we begin to intake information and our mind begins to grow and we get more information and our mind grows and we educate ourselves and more and more knowledge goes throughout our whole life. It is that way with sanctifying grace. Our spiritual journey begins with justifying grace. We say, yes to God, I want a relationship. We have conversion. We're salvation in that moment. We're born again. That is the beginning of our spiritual journey toward maturity. We call that moving toward spiritual maturity, sanctifying grace or growing in grace. Our goal is, as Christians is to be further on our spiritual journey this year 
than we were last year. I want to be a better Christian tomorrow than I am today. And that doesn't mean that I'm not going to stumble, fall, and have to start again. That's just part of life. That's how the journey goes. But we cannot do this on our own. You hear people say, you, you can do it on your own. We cannot do it without the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our life. God's grace is seen in two areas, that Holy Spirit working. The first is God's active love toward us. We know that God loves us. What a beautiful prayer, Shervil. We know that God loves us. Before I entered into ministry, <clears throat> I... Uh, called up my associate pastor uh, who was at, at Bixby first at the time. Steve Morgan was his name. And as most pastors, we don't ever do anything. We're just waiting for your call so we can make time for you. Um, so I called him up and I said, hey, what are you doing? He said, nothing. Okay. Now I know better, but at the moment I took it at face value. And so I stopped by his office on the way home and I sat down with him and I'd been hearing my call. I'd been starting to answer my call. I'm working toward saying yes to the call and I just felt worthless. How could God use someone like me was my thought. I, I wasn't a bad person. I mean, I didn't do bad things. I, I was a good guy. I mean, um, you know, I... I did the right things. I tried to do the best by my family. But I just had this innate sense within me that I wasn't worth answering the call to ministry. And so I came in and Steve, just as he said, he was doing nothing when I got there. And uh, he set me down on his couch and we began to have this conversation. And he asked me a question that I struggled with. He said, Rudy, what determines your worth? I'm like, well, uh, well, it's a good question. What determines my worth? Is it my family? Is it my friends? Is it my church? What determines my worth? And as I worked through that process, struggling to figure that out, I wasn't the brightest tool in the shed. Um, usually in church, as a kid, you grow up and you learn that there's a, an answer to everything, right? And that answer is Jesus, yes. Um, so I didn't catch that class. I missed that one. Finally, it hit me. I said, well, God determines my worth. He says, you're absolutely right. God determines your worth. And you know what? God said you were so worthy that he sent Jesus Christ to the cross to die for you. I hope you just heard that. God thinks you're so worthy that he sent Jesus Christ to the cross to die for you. That's how much God loves you. And it opened my mind. It changed how I thought about God's love for me. And so we receive that love that God has for us. And then we do a second thing. We put that love into action toward others. We start to share that love toward the world that God created. And so we help others in the midst of that. When we genuinely experience God's grace, we're so moved by God's love and action in our life that we respond with love and action as well. You see, sanctifying grace is the process of opening ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us. The Holy Spirit working in our heart transforms our heart, begins to change our heart, and it makes us ripe and ready for glory. Becoming ready for glory begins with restoring our relationship with God and others. You see, there's no possible way any of us can earn God's love by changing our ways. He already loves us. <clears throat> the idea that we have to have that relationship with others is important too. Jesus said, forgive those who have sinned against you. If you don't, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you of your sins. Let that set for a second. That is our greatest challenge with forgiveness, is forgiving those who have wronged us. Yet, He commands that we do it. We change our ways because God loves us, and He gives us grace to start afresh day by day, every day. I don't know about you, sometimes I have a bad day. Are there times where you have a bad day? Isn't it a beautiful thing to go to bed at the end of the night, rest through the night, 
and wake up the next morning and start again. That's how it is with God's grace. When we mess up, we get to start again. He loves us that much. When we receive the Holy Spirit, it's like Romans 16. When we receive that justifying grace and sanctifying grace, it's in that moment that God's Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. It is the affirmation that we are His and we belong to Him. <clears throat> There's no doubt in that moment, in that relationship, when we experience justifying grace, it's in that moment that the righteousness of Christ is imparted to us. When we say, yes, Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life, it's imparted right then. You're clean. We're declared not guilty in that moment because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And we experience a change of status. We were guilty. Now we're not guilty. Can you imagine being in a courtroom to hear that sound, that gavel fall? Not guilty. That's what it's going to sound like. Sanctifying grace is the process by which the righteousness of Christ is imparted to us. It becomes a part of us. We experience a change of heart. That change of heart leads to that day-by-day -day journey of becoming more and more Christ-like in our attitudes and our actions. Having been born again through justifying grace, we grow and we mature spiritually through the work of sanctifying grace. Think about that physical birth again. You're born into a specific family. You have a family name, right? You have some characteristics, traits that were passed down from generation to generation in your family. You carry those on. <clears throat> those were imputed to you. Well, so too in our faith journey. We have characteristics and traits passed down, imparted to us, by Christ, by Christ. Conversion is a process. It happens once, but not all at once. It's this lifelong process of dying to ourselves, putting our sinful nature aside, and moving into the good and true nature that Christ has called us. And God empowers us with those special gifts for the spiritual journey. The gifts of the Spirit enable us to grow. They enable us to build the body of Christ, but they also enable us to build our faith. As the Christian matures, our life begins to display those certain qualities. Your friends and family begin to see a different person in you. It's the fruit of the Spirit that begin to develop. Galatians 5, 20. We talk about how the fruits of the Spirit begin to manifest. Before I was walking with Christ in my life, I was not a nice person. I wasn't an evil person. I was just not a nice person. You all think I'm blunt sometimes? You should have seen me before Jesus. But as we get to know Christ and as we let the Holy Spirit start to work in us, the fruits of the Spirit begin to develop. Galatians 5.22, fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those begin to manifest because we're living the way that Christ wants us to live. And Christ implants those into our souls. Y'all know growing up, I grew up on a farm, and <clears throat> my dad had a big orchard, maybe 25 or 30 trees. When you're this tall, though, big is, you know, three trees, but I'm pretty sure it was 20 or 25. <laughs> but I would go out, and I would look up and just stare up at the trees and just see all the fruit. We had oranges and apples and pears, and I don't remember what else. We had tons of fruit that grew on the trees. <clears throat> One day I went out with my dad, and, and uh, the trees were just, I mean, there was fruit everywhere. It just looked like tons of fruit on every branch. And Dad took out a pair of pruners, and he began to snip off some of the limbs. And I would watch these limbs fall, and I'd watch fruit fall to the ground, just wasted. So I kind of questioned my dad a little bit, and he was like, well, you don't understand, Rudy. He said, if, if you don't prune those branches, the tree will produce less fruit because it will be, have too, too much fullness to it, and not all of the tree will get the nutrients from the sun and things of that nature. And he said, so you prune it so that it will produce healthier and more fruit. That's how our relationship with Christ works. Now, just a question. Does anybody have any unproductive habits in their life they need to prune so they can know Jesus a little more? Oh, y'all are even more honest than the third or second service. First service, I had to have them all repent. <laughs> 
It's a joke if you're watching this again. <laughs> we do. We all have unhealthy habits that develop in our life. These beautiful little things, iPads and phones, they come up with this little thing now that uh, every week it tells you your screen time. I wish I could turn it off, <laughs> but I can't. There are things in our life that stand between us and our relationship with God. We get so tied into them that we, we lose track of time. What if we spent that time praying, reading God's Word, studying a little more? We all have things in our life that needs to be pruned. Our spiritual life needs to be pruned from time to time. A life in grace is a life in process, and sometimes process is painful. Sometimes pruning is painful. The question today for you is, what does God need to prune in your life so that you'll bear more fruit? Christian perfection is both instantaneous and progressive. The Greek word used for perfect can actually be translated mature or complete. So just as someone can be mature as a five-year-old, you've seen them before, a five-year-old that's more mature than the rest of the five-year-olds around them, they're a mature five-year-old. Fifteen years later, as a 20-year-old, they can also be mature as a 20-year-old. Right? <clears throat> So is the process of being perfected in God's love. In Christ, you can be perfect, mature, and complete today, yet still grow in your grace and be even more Christ-like in a month or a year from now. To be perfected in God's love is both God's call to us as well as His promise. We look at sanctifying grace as the doctrine of the more. God has more love for you. God has more power for you. God has more fruit for you. God has more peace for you. God has so much more in store for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God has more for you. If you awkwardly didn't have a neighbor, turn to someone behind you and say, God has more for you. God has more for you. God has more for me. It doesn't matter where we're at on this spiritual journey. If we're just starting or if we think we're this far along, God has more for us. And he wants to pour that more into us. That sanctifying grace is how God pours more into us. It is a deep joy and a great good in all of our relationships that that sanctifying grace is working toward. It is God equipping us for the work of Christ in the world. It means for us to be the hands and feet of Christ. <clears throat> Sanctifying grace is the work of the Holy Spirit, empowering us to see and to serve the least and the lost to the ends of the world. If you remember the story Jesus told in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse, starts in verse 31. It starts with, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and it talks about he will separate them. Sheep on the right, and goats on the left. Right? So he divides them up. It's in the midst of that that he tells the sheep on the right, he said, blessed are you, come on into the kingdom, it's ready for you. And he says, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came and visited me. When I was in prison, you saw me. Jesus says, well done, come on in. And they go, whoa, hold on, Jesus. When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you sick? We, did, we didn't know you were in prison. We didn't do any of these things. And Jesus says that you, what you have done to the least of these, you have done for me. And then he turns to the goats. He's like, not good for you. Not good for the goats. And they're like, well, we didn't see you in those ways or we would have helped you. Again, you saw the least of these suffering. He says, away from me. That's what Christ says. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving water to the thirsty, caring for the sick and the prisoner. Those are the traits of a follower of Christ. These are the things that we are compelled to do because of our changed heart 
and our changed attitude. We use the very gifts that the Holy Spirit equips us with to accomplish those functions. Now, I know you've probably, I don't know, what have I been your pastor? A month and a day, okay? It's two months and a day. Sorry. Feels like a month. That's good for me. Maybe it feels like three for you. But Each and every person sitting in this room is gifted by the Holy Spirit. Have you heard that before? Yeah. You know why you hear that so much? Because it's true. And until you believe it, and live it out, I'm going to preach it and teach it. You have been gifted by the power of the Holy Spirit to use your gifts to build the kingdom and to grow the church. He gives those to us to do that. It is for you to discover the gift that God has given you and to use that gift to advance the kingdom. When the church universal is seeking God's gifts and using them for God's kingdom and purposes, that's when His perfect will will be accomplished. The Holy Spirit equips us and empowers us to, do, to obey the great commandment and the great commission. Those two things. Jesus gave us the great commandment, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the foremost commandment, the great and foremost commandment. The second is it to love your neighbor like yourself. We get this wrong. We mix those up. We elevate love of neighbor above love of God, don't we? We do that with good intention. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So we say, we say, you know what? I love you enough not to hurt your feelings. We don't speak truth to people anymore because we're afraid we're going to hurt their feelings. When at the very end of things, What needs to happen is people need to hear truth. As Wesleyans, we call it doing no harm. How much harm does it cause when we tell people lies or we allow them to live in lies? If you had cancer, would you want your doctor to feel nervous about telling you because it might upset you and so they don't tell you? Or would you want them to be truthful with you and tell you where you're at, what's going on, and how we're going to tackle it and, and handle it? When we don't tell the sinner about the sin, we're giving them a terminal death sentence. We must love God first. Keep His commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus is God. So if God gave a commandment, Jesus gave a commandment. And then the final instructions Jesus gave His disciples is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, telling them to observe all I have commanded. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said, Go and tell. We have to be a church about going and telling. We have to be evangelical presence in our community. We have to go and tell about Jesus to our neighbors. We've got to go and tell Jesus to Jesus about tell about Jesus to the people in the grocery store at the gas pumps, wherever it might be. We have got to share the gospel message. Why? Because it's the good news. We have got to tell people about the love that Christ has for them, that they are just as worthy as we are for God's love, and they're just as worthy to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. Jesus told us to go. And I can promise you this, if you will be bold enough to take the step, the Holy Spirit will empower you enough to make it all happen. I often hear people say, well, I can't go because... The Bible assures us that God will equip us through the power of the Holy Spirit if we will simply step out and do it. The great commandment and the great commission. When you don't feel you can do it, seek God for the strength and the boldness. So sanctification is this process of moving on to perfection. John Wesley uh, framed it, uh, you know, the idea that, that we can get there in this life. He never felt he made it. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't live into the holiness that God's called us to be. 
living a life of self-examination, submission to the pursuit of Christ, that will lead to a journey of sanctification. We also know that when we pass from this earth, when that glorious day happens, I don't know, I don't know if you look forward to it. I look forward to death. I honestly do. Because that will be the day where I stand in the presence of the Savior. Piper and I have DNRs. If I get a finger prick and it's infected, she's going to tell him, don't save him, let him go. <laughs> That's mostly for insurance reasons, but... <laughs> we do, we have DNRs. Don't put me on a machine. We've, we've agreed that if we, if we decide to save the other one, we're going to kick the rear whenever we get back to health to do that. Because we want to see our Savior. We want to stare in His face. We want to hear the heavenlies sing, Holy, holy, holy. Glory to God in the eyes. We want to, we want to, we want to experience heaven. And put the pain of this life beyond. When we get to heaven, we will be entirely sanctified. We will be perfect. Just the way God wanted us to be. Righteous, holy, and complete. Righteous, holy, and complete. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for sanctification. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live a life moving in a direction. Lord, we thank you that you wash the sins away. You take away the urge to sin. Lord, until that day that we're perfectly sanctified, let us forever be on the journey to grow closer and closer to the likeness of Christ. Lord, lay that plan out in front of us. Help us to see it. Help us to live into it. For your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.